As the passenger plane glided high above the Pacific's inky expanse, I settled into my cheap but safe seat at the tail end of the cabin, taking a contemplative sip of Jim Beam. The serene calm outside was a stark contrast to the growing unease building inside me. The proximity to the plane's bathroom made the air saturated with a funky, bacteria-laden odor, which was only exacerbated by the hulking figure beside me on the aisle seat. He was a veritable mountain of flesh, hunched over a tray of greasy, stale airline food. The relentless slurps, burps, and crunches of his eating pierced through the cabin, each sound more discordant than the last. It felt as though every bite was a personal affront, shattering any hope of relaxation. How he could eat like that next to a restroom, I had no idea. The discomfort of his gross eating was just the beginning. The plane suddenly lurched violently, turbulence striking with a force that threw the cabin into chaos. The man's eating noises transformed into frantic, guttural cries. He abruptly put his chicken breast down, and his hands, coated in barbecue sauce, clutched the armrests with white-knuckled terror. His panic in the cabin was palpable, infecting everyone. I tried to offer comforting words to him, but my voice was lost in the cacophony of fear. Women began to screech uncontrollably in rising terror, and the garbled, panicked voices was rising. In a horrifying twist, the giant next to me sprang to his feet with explosive force, catapulting his tray of junk food everywhere. My mind raced in confusion. What was he doing? I assumed, with mounting dread, that he was preparing to confront the pilots. As he stumbled forward and down the aisle, he veered left as my fear turned to shock. The giant wedged his immense bulk against the emergency exit door and wrenched it open with terrifying strength. My jaw dropped as I watched, horrified, as two flight attendants, both slender, wiry men, rushed to intervene. Despite their desperate efforts, their small frames were no match for his raw power. He tossed one steward out of the plane like a rag doll, the poor man's body instantly swallowed by the void. The second steward, trying to stabilize himself, extended one hand to the cabin ceiling, battling with the giant for control of the door. But he too was overpowered. The colossal man kicked him in the ribcage, sending him spiraling out of the plane. With the emergency door left wide open, the plane's equilibrium was lost, and the cabin's sudden depressurization was deafening. I could barely catch my breath as we plummeted toward the dark, menacing abyss of the ocean below. Everything went dark as I passed out. When I regained consciousness, my eyes were met with bright sunshine, and I was propped against a palm tree on what seemed to be a small island. Pain flared through my left arm, which was apparently broken and crudely cradled in a bloody dress shirt. An overpowering stench filled the air. Surrounded by the wreckage of the plane and dozens of mangled bodies, I stared at the horrifying sight several feet ahead of me. The monstrous villain was calmly seated on a large rock next to a roaring fire about thirty feet away. He was munching on a roasted bicep. The sight made me wretch, and I vomited up everything in my gut. I found out that the only other survivors were Hal Jansen, a rugged man with some medical training who had tended to my arm, and Steve Gallo, the plane's co-pilot. They appeared to be unharmed and quietly approached me to discuss our dire situation. Steve informed me about the purple elephant in the room, our resident cannibal. He had miraculously cooperated enough to reveal his full name. Cyrus Brooks, and his background as a football coach headed for a soccer tournament in Sydney, Australia. He raged against the incompetent pilots while gnawing on human remains. Furthermore, he also stated that he suffered from polyphagia, a medical condition which caused extreme, insatiable hunger. Steve said that he had initially helped Cyrus build the bonfire for cremation purposes, but became revolted when Cyrus began consuming cooked body parts. Steve told us we were on a large atoll with sparse, inedible shrubbery. He had helped the captain send out an SOS with our coordinates before the crash. 
we needed to wait for rescue teams, but there was also a small fishing village about 100 days away to the south-southwest. The plane had a six-person life raft, emergency rations for six, a sea compass, a sextant, celestial and sea navigation charts, and possibly a flare gun. Hal and Steve said that they would salvage what they could, and asked me to keep a watch on Cyrus, who was now lying on his side in front of the fire. Steve gave me an orange emergency whistle to blow if Cyrus tried anything. Hal gave me a small bottle of Percocet and a bottle of water. He handed me two of the pills and the water with a sad smile on his face. He stood, and the two men headed into thick shrubbery behind me. I later learned that he and Steve had located the intact life raft and most of the emergency supplies. I lay back against the palm tree, waiting for the medication to take effect. Cyrus remained motionless. As the night deepened, Steve and Hal stealthily returned to my side. Steve whispered urgently that we needed to leave now. They helped me to my feet and guided me to a cove where the raft was inflated and loaded with provisions. We had to escape from Cyrus before he discovered our plan. Just as we were about to set off, thick clouds obscured the moonlight, plunging us into partial darkness. Cyrus emerged from the bushes, his eyes wild and his movements aggressive. Planning to leave me behind? I don't think so, he growled. He proceeded to physically attack both Steve and Hal with terrifying strength. I pushed the huge, bright yellow raft into the water with my good arm. With a mixture of fear and hope, I hurled my body into it and prayed. A strong current immediately whisked the raft away from shore. After dispatching both men with his bare hands, Cyrus struggled in the surf after me. As he ventured out further, he appeared to get caught in a riptide and was pulled underwater. I watched the area where he had vanished, my heart pounding with a mix of hope and dread. When he didn't resurface, I let out a cry of relief, feeling a small measure of safety. I leaned back and closed my eyes, convinced that the riptide had finished him off. When I awoke, unsure how much time had passed, my broken arm throbbed fiercely. There was no wind, and the stagnant current had not carried the raft very far from shore, perhaps 100 yards from the atoll. The sky was dark, and I was surrounded by the darkness of the ocean. From the raft I spotted a distant light starboard, likely a large commercial fishing boat. I struggled to get into a seated position to signal for help. Excitement surged as I carefully maneuvered into place, enduring the extreme pain of my arm. I quickly located the flare gun, I slowly loaded it, and I braced myself with my knees as I extended the gun outside the raft's overhead cover, facing it toward the night sky. The raft must have looked like a tiny rubber duck on the indigo ocean. But then I heard splashing. I turned toward the small strip of land I had fled from and saw him. Cyrus was swimming toward me, his face crazed and full of rage, occasionally breaking the surface for air. Despite his earlier struggles, he was closing in on me with relentless determination. My heart raced. I faced an agonizing choice. Use the flare to defend myself, or signal for help. Just as I was about to take aim, the decision was made for me. As Cyrus reached the raft and attempted to pull himself up, he suddenly struggled with severe cramping. His agony was such that he relinquished his grip and began to sink. I watched in a mix of relief and horror as Cyrus's wild face disappeared beneath the waves. His thrashing grew weaker, his struggles more sporadic. My fear and pain seemed to melt away as I focused on the distant light of the fishing boat, my chance for rescue slipping away. With a trembling hand, I aimed the flare gun at the sky. The gun recoiled with a sharp kick as the flare shot up, illuminating the darkened ocean for a brief, brilliant moment. I watched as the flare arced upward and then fell away, its light casting eerie shadows on the water below. The flare lit up the surrounding sea. After several minutes, I saw the boat's silhouette growing larger. I kept my gaze fixed on it, praying they had seen my signal. My heart pounded and I kept a watchful eye on the area where Cyrus had vanished. 
I hoped that whatever remained of him would be swept far from me. Minutes felt like hours as I waited, straining to hear any signs of help or see the boat drawing nearer. My thoughts were a chaotic mix of fear and relief. Even as hope began to build, I remained tense and vigilant. Finally, I spotted the searchlights of a much smaller boat piercing the darkness. It was approaching from the starboard side of the larger ship. Relief washed over me like a warm tide. I waved frantically with my good arm, using the last of my energy to make sure they saw me. The boat angled toward me, its hull cutting through the water with purpose. As the boat drew alongside, crew members reached down, pulling me from the raft with care and placing me on deck. Exhausted and in pain, I slumped against the railing, overwhelmed with gratitude. I looked back at the raft, the empty expanse of ocean, and the atoll, a mix of dread and thankfulness filling me. The crew wrapped me in a thermal blanket and offered immediate first aid. As they steered the smaller boat around and back toward the larger vessel, I allowed myself a moment to relax, the ordeal starting to settle into the realm of memory rather than immediate threat. The Coast Guard would be notified and Cyrus's menace would end with him lost to the sea. For now I was safe, and that was all that mattered to me. Soul survivor guilt would haunt me later.